We seem to be in control of how we move our bodies, at least most of the time. You can probably pet a dog, kick a ball, or shake your head at will. You might assume that when you do any of these things, you first think about the movement you want to make, then your conscious intention causes your brain to initiate a sequence of neural activity that starts in the brain and descends through the spinal cord, eventually causing your muscles to contract. But what if it's not a conscious decision that starts the whole chain off? What if free will in relation to our movements is just an illusion? An experiment by Benjamin Libet and his colleagues in 1983 suggested that we might have much less conscious control over our movements than we tend to think. Libet's instructions to participants in his experiment were simple. Flex your fingers or wrist whenever you feel like it. Don't plan the movements in advance, let them be spontaneous. Look at a clock throughout the experiment and report when you first experience the urge or intention to move. While subjects performed this task in the lab, Libet measured the electrical activity of their brains using electroencephalography, or EEG. Libet was particularly interested in detecting the readiness potential, a gradual increase in brain activity that occurs shortly before movement. The point of the study was to compare the timing of the readiness potential with the timing of the conscious intention to move. When he averaged many experimental trials together, Libet found that the readiness potential began about 550 milliseconds before the subject's finger muscles started contracting. But the subject reported having the conscious intention to move only about 200 milliseconds before movement began. That suggests the brain had already been preparing the movement for about 350 milliseconds by the time the subject even felt the urge to move. Libet argued that these results indicate that we have to dramatically rethink our ideas about voluntary movement, and even free will. Since the readiness potential precedes the urge to move, our spontaneous movements must be initiated unconsciously. Despite appearances then, our conscious intentions don't actually cause our actions. Although Libet's experiments have received a lot of attention, there are a few objections to the idea that they support skepticism about free will. First, critics argue that the results don't generalize to our everyday actions. Subjects were brought into a lab and instructed just to flex their fingers within a particular window of time. This simple task is far from a typical example of voluntary movement. Philosophers have argued that even if Libet is right that our conscious intentions aren't causally responsible for arbitrary spontaneous movements like random finger flexes, that doesn't mean that conscious intentions don't play an important role in other sorts of actions. Actions. In other words, Libet's experiment doesn't tell us much of anything about actions that we actually care about having conscious control over. Second, philosopher Adina Roskies denies that Libet managed to measure the time at which subjects experience the conscious intention to move. Remember that subjects were told to watch a clock face and report when they felt the urge to move. Roskies argues that this actually measures the timing of subjects' awareness of their conscious intention to move, rather than the timing of the intention itself. In other words, what we care about is a mental state whose content is move finger. But subjects' reports are about a state with the content, I am conscious of having a state with the content, move finger. Libet's experiments might show that awareness of the intention to move occurs at about 200 milliseconds before the onset of movement, but it doesn't measure the timing of the conscious intention to move itself. So Libet's results are consistent with the conscious intention occurring much earlier. A third set of criticisms relate to Libet's interpretation of the EEG signal. The readiness potential is difficult to interpret because it's only visible when you average over dozens of trials, which are aligned using time of movement onset as a reference point. Moreover, Libet only recorded EEG responses when subjects did end up moving. He didn't look to see whether the readiness potential was present in trials without movement. Nevertheless, for decades it was assumed that the readiness potential measures brain activity that causes movement. But that assumption has recently been challenged. A family of models of decision-making, called stochastic decision models, posit that the brain makes various kinds of decisions by gradually accumulating evidence. Once the accumulated evidence crosses a threshold, a decision is reached. Importantly, in addition to external sources of evidence, Accumulation in these models is also driven by random noise. 
Neuroscientist Aaron Schruger and colleagues have recently shown that the stochastic decision model of Libet's experiments can account for the observed results. Because there were no external cues prompting subjects to move, they may have relied on evidence accumulation driven by random fluctuations in brain activity. If this were the case, the times when a participant decides to move would be preceded by a gradual increase in activity. This would explain the shape of readiness potential and why it seems to come before the conscious intention to move. The model suggests then that the readiness potential isn't the result of a decision to move having already been made as Libet assumed. Instead, it just reflects the stochastic processes leading up to the decision to move. If modelers are right, then it's not necessarily the case that the brain initiates movement long before the mind is aware of it. For these reasons, many philosophers and neuroscientists are skeptical that Libet's experiment proved that we lack conscious control over our movements. Rather, they think the neural activity that Libet detected is entirely compatible with certain notions of free will. The debate about the experiment may not be settled, but it's already shown how fruitful work at the intersection of neuroscience and philosophy can be.